Um, I would like to say again how thrilled I am that you all came tonight, how thrilled I am that Litquake joined with UCSF in hosting this event, and um, that the, the two worlds of CP Snow are so obviously joined as one. Um, I'm going to start with the poems on Alzheimer's that Bruce referred to. Um, I dedicate them to the man they were about, um, the Berkeley poet Leonard Nathan, who was very public about his own early diagnosis of Alzheimer's and for many years after that diagnosis wrote absolutely magnificent poems. Um, I went to visit him in the later stages, not knowing quite what I was going to find. Um, I called up uh, the director of the residence that he was in, and she painted a very dire picture of what I might find. And I guess I was lucky, and when I visited him, it was a good day. Um, these two poems both describe that visit. The quotes are perfectly accurate. And what it taught me was exactly what this first poem describes, which is, I hadn't understood, having never met anybody in late stage Alzheimer's, the unevenness of it, and how much what is not touched in these neural circuits remains exactly as it was, the learnedness, the courtliness, the kindness. Alzheimer's. When a fine old carpet is eaten by mice, the colors and patterns of what's left behind do not change. As bedrock tilted stays bedrock, its purple and red striations unbroken. Unstrippable birthright grandeur. How are you, I asked, not knowing what to expect. Contrary to Keatsian joy, he replied. Yeah, isn't that great? I couldn't say that on a good day. <laughs> the pear. November. One pear sways on the tree, past leaves, past reason. In the nursing home, my friend has fallen. Chased, he said, from the freckled woods by angry Thoreau, Coleridge, and Beaumarchais. Delusion, too, it seems, can be well read. <laughs> he is courteous, well spoken, even in dread. The old fineness in him hangs on for dear life. My mind now? A small ship under the wake of a large. They force you to walk on your heels here. The angles matter four or five degrees, and you're lost. Life is dear to him yet. Though he believes it his own fault, he grieves his own fault. His old friends have turned against him like crows against an injured of their kind. There is no kindness here, no flint of mercy. Descend, descend. Some voice must urge inside the pear stem. The argument goes on. He cannot outrun it. Dawn light to dawn light, I look. It is still there. So I had a kind of dilemma about reading you earlier poems or newer poems. I had no idea I had as many poems about science as I have until I went to put this reading together and realized I have as many poems that touch on science as I have that touch on food. Um, <laughs> and I write a lot about food. Um, but I'm going to go for the newer ones and we'll see if I stop and give you any earlier ones. Um, in his presentation, Bruce was describing the folding of proteins. And one of the great penny-dropping moments for me was when somebody told me some years ago that the word protein takes its name from the Greek god figure Proteus, who changed shapes. 
Um, so this is a quite recent poem. It was in the New Yorker maybe a month ago, titled My Proteins. They have discovered, they say, the protein of itch, natureetic polypeptide B, and that it travels its own distinct pathway inside my spine, as do pain, pleasure, and heat. A body, it seems, is a highway, a cloverleaf crossing, well-built, well-traversed, some of me going north, some going south. 90% of my cells, they have discovered, are not my own person. They are other beings inside me, as 96% of my life is not my life. Yet I, they say, am they. My bacteria and yeasts, my father and mother, grandparents, lovers, my drivers talking on cell phones, my subways and bridges, my thieves, my police who chase myself night and day. My proteins, apparently also me, fold the shirts. I find in this crowded metropolis a quiet corner where I build of not me Lego blocks, a bench, pigeons, a sandwich of rye bread, mustard, and cheese. It is me and is not the hunger that makes the sandwich good. It is not me then is the sandwich, a mystery neither of us can fold, unfold, or consume. I mean, this is one of those things I've wondered about since I was like seven years old. When you eat the sandwich, when does it start being you? Um, and I have pursued the question of self and not self over Buddhist hill and dale and scientific um, microbiome um, to this day. Um, uh, so, so, so this next one, there's a little series of new poems that will be in the next book, all of which are my this, my that. Um, this is my skeleton. And by the way, what is fact-checkable has been fact-checked. So the 90% the of the cells not being you, that's fact-checked, at least by the New York Times that I got it from. Um, but the 96% of my life is not my life I made up. Um, so, so this one um, refers to the way, as we all have learned and some of us seen in our relatives and ourselves, uh, the way that uh, bone reabsorbs as we age and we get lighter and shorter and all of those things. Just as when we were little, we had those growing pains while it was all getting bigger. I have no idea if those growing pains actually are related to bones. My skeleton. My skeleton, who once ached with your own growing larger, are now, each year, imperceptibly smaller, lighter, absorbed by your own concentration. When I danced, you danced. When you broke, I. And so it was, lying down, walking, climbing the tiring stairs. Your jaws, my bread. Someday you, what is left of you, will be flensed of this marriage. Angular wrist bones, arthritis, cracked harp of rib cage, blunt of heel, opened bowl of the skull, twin platters of pelvis. Each of you will leave me behind, at last serene. What did I know of your days, your nights? I who held you all my life inside my hands and thought they were empty. You who held me all my life inside your hands as a new mother holds her own unblanketed child, not thinking at all. Uh, this is for the uh, research scientists in the audience. Um, and it has, I don't know, most of the words you probably all know, but the one word which you might not know is, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, kipos. And this is an ancient Peruvian device, which is a kind of hybrid between 
um, a calculator abacus and a record keeping calendar. The problem. You are trying to solve a problem. You're almost certainly halfway done, maybe more. You take some salt, some alum, and put it into the problem. Its color goes from yellow to royal blue. You tie a knot of royal blue into the problem as into a Peruvian kipos of colored string. You enter the problem's bodegas, its flea markets, souks. Amid the alleys of sponges and sweets, of jewelry, spices, and hair combs, hair combs you ponder which stall, which pumpkin or perfume is yours. You go inside the problem's piano. You choose three keys. One surely must open the door of the problem if only you knew only this. Is the quandary edible or medical? A problem of reason or grief? It is looking back at you now with the quizzical look of a young bright dog. Her whole body pitched for the fetch. The dog wants to please. If only she could ascertain which direction, what object, which scent of riddle, and if the problem is round or elliptical in its orbit, and if it is measured in foot pounds, memory, or meat. I'm reading un, unusually longer poems. Um, I don't know, not all my science poems are longer, but this little run has been. This one I have never actually read out loud, I don't think. It appeared in the New York Times in a series of poems. They occasionally put out a call for thematic poems, and um, I was asked for tax day, April 15th, a um, couple of years ago. And I had a poem with the word tax in it, and they accepted that. Um, it has nothing to do with taxes. It has a great deal to do with explanation. Um, I wrote it after hearing a, a cognitive linguist talking about the nature of explanation. So while it takes a while to get there, that's where it ends up. Um, and it has a couple of very brief runs of genetic code in it. Shaggy dog poem. How rarely I have stopped to thank the steady effort. A person speaking pauses, lets in a little silence portion with the words. It is like an hour, any hour, this one. Something happens, much does not. Or as always, everything happens. The standing walls keep standing with their whole attention. A noisy crow call lowers and lifts its branch. The crow scent enters the leaves, enters the bark, like stirred in honey gone into the tea. How rarely I have stopped to thank the steady effort of the world to stay the world, to thank the furnish of green and abandon of yellow. The ancient Sumerians called their beloved honey, as we do said also, borrowed bread is not returned. Like them, we, pays, we pay love's tax to bees. We go on arranging the old notes in different orders. Desire inside, A-C-A-G-G-A-T. Forgiveness in, G-T-A-C-T-T. -T. In a world of space and time, arrangement matters. An hour has no front or back, except to those whose eyes face forward, whose tears blur thought and stars. Five genes in a certain arrangement will spend this life unrooted, grazing. It has to do with how the animal body comes into being, the same whether ant or camel. What then? Does such unfolded code understand if it utters the word important? The thing that can be carried or the thing that cannot? Or the way they keep trading places, grief and gladness, the comic, the glum, the dead, the living? Last night, the big Sumerian moon 
clambered into the house empty-handed and left empty-handed. Not thief, not lover, not tortoise, just looking around, shuffling its soft blind slippers over the floor. This felt to me important, and so I looked back with both hands open, palms unblinking. What causes fire, we ask, meaning lightning, wiring, matches? How precisely and unbidden oxygen sleeps, slips itself into between those solid words. So I think, let's see, one more newer poem. Hmm, two more newer poems and then one quick earlier one. Um, any physicists in the room, I'm talking about applied physics. <laughs> Don't want to insult. Quartz clock. The ideas of a physicist can be turned into useful objects, a rocket, a quartz clock, a microwave oven for cooking. The ideas of poets turn into only themselves, as the hands of the clock do, or the face of a person. It changes, but only more into the person. Uh, this one for the Memory and Aging Center, my hosts. Um, my task. An idea appears. It catches against the edge of the bedside table. Coffee on the wall, coffee on the marble tabletop, coffee on the sheets. The idea has flown everywhere with it. A plesia, marine snail of memory, someone someday will find in your 20,000 neurons the thought I have lost. <laughs> My task is to find your less studied sister, the erasing and soapy sea sponge. Okay, so for the last poem, This is one of um, three poems that have been turned into beautiful letterpress broadsides and will be left hanging in, in the UCSF hallways after I have been replaced by a different visiting artist. Um, the poem is Optimism. More and more I have come to admire resilience. Not the simple resistance of a pillow whose foam returns over and over to the same shape, but the sinuous tenacity of a tree. Finding the light newly blocked on one side, it turns in another. A blind intelligence, true, but out of such persistence arose turtles, rivers, mitochondria, figs, all this resinous, unretractable earth. Thank you very much.